hey everyone, I'm here. And I'm sorry I'm a little bit late. I had a bit of setting up to do. So I have so much to talk about tonight on this Elizabethan dress. Actually, Queen Elizabeth the first dress. Hey, Becky. I'm leaning down. <laughs> I have it set up so you can see the dress really well. So I have to like scooch down if you're going to see me. Or I could get my chair. I guess I could go get my chair. I will be right back. So, all right, so hopefully you can see, now you can see there, now you can see me in the dress at the same time. I want to showcase this amazing dress. <laughs> so who's there tonight? Becky and Betty and Lori. <laughs> um, okay, so this is, um, I wanted to talk tonight about my first Elizabethan project. This is my very first Elizabethan project, but a lot of thought and work has gone into this dress. It is not finished. This is not finished. So you know, it's pinned, part of it's are pinned together. So I'm gonna tell you the whole long story. Um, oh, thank you. See, I was having a bad hair day. It was bad weather and I had a bad hair day. So this is one of my, wonderful little hats that I bought on my trip to Scotland last year. I love this hat. I love hats in general. You guys know that. So, okay. Um, the Elizabethan dress. This really is a work still, a work in progress. I'm still sewing and tweaking. It's finished enough for her to come for a fitting. She does need to try this on with her corset and the appropriate underpinnings. I need to make sure it fits. Um, this dress is for Heather author, Heather McCollum, who's going to be portraying Queen Elizabeth I, who is one of her personal heroes. Um, and she's going to be doing this in Colonial Williamsburg at our Queens of Fashion show that is coming up next month. It is not too late to get tickets. If you are interested in the whole event, it's called Romancing Williamsburg. It's March 18th to the 22nd www.romancingwilliamsburg.com. Tickets are only $150 for the conference. Um, hotel rooms are $169 a night, and you can share rooms with people. A lot of people share three and four to a room, so it's pretty cheap that way, and it is in the heart of historic colonial Williamsburg. So, um, I came up with this idea last year. I did a fashion show at the same event, and it was more of a generic. It was um, just the evolution of fashion I picked from the year 1700 to 1800. So I showed the, uh, the first dresses that were in fashion early in the century. And um, I think there were 13 models um, who, who modeled the outfits, but they were just um, daytime dresses and evening dresses, riding habits, just all the different, I tried to represent all the major changes in fashion during that whole century. Um, this year I wanted to do something and it was good and I was really proud of it and happy and I think everybody enjoyed it. But this year I really wanted to raise the bar and for myself I wanted to be more challenged. Not that that wasn't a challenge, it was, but this is a huge challenge. So this year I decided I wanted to pick queens from history uh, from out, throughout different periods of history, but queens who were particularly um, influential, who were fashion icons, or just, you know, or if you're very powerful, that automatically makes you a fashion icon because the powerful people always set the fashion. So um, I picked the most influential and fashionable queens in history, a, a sampling of them. So we have uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine from the, was she the 13th or 14th century? I think she's early 14th. I have to, I have to go back and look to be sure. She could be 13th. She's the earliest one. And then we have um, Elis Isabella of Castile. She, she was married to Ferdinand and they united Spain. And, and that was when Spain became such a powerful empire. Um, she was, uh, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. They financed Columbus. So she was in the 15th century. I think she died around 1602 or so. 
And then uh, Queen Elizabeth comes next. She was 16th century and into the early 17th century, I believe. Um, then we have, uh, okay, so Isabella, Elizabeth, oh, Mary Queen of Scots, Mary Stuart, we have her. She, um, she lived at the same time as Elizabeth, but I portrayed them as different fashion eras. I put um, Mary Stuart in a Tudor outfit, and Elizabeth herself revolutionized fashion. So Elizabeth is Elizabethan, and I did Mary Stuart in, in Tudor. Um, so uh, let me see. So um, Amanda, uh, Amanda Mariel's doing um, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, Anna St. Clair's doing Isabella of Castile. Dee Foster is doing, um, she's not an author, author, but she's an author assistant and she already had the awesome outfit. I made her the outfit, the Tudor gown, like a year and a half, two years ago, and it was perfect, so we had to use it. So Dee Foster is portraying Mary Stewart or Mary Queen of Scots. Heather McCollum is doing Queen Elizabeth. Then we have Catherine the Great being portrayed by Catherine Bone. And we have uh, Marie Antoinette being portrayed by Lauren Smith. And we have um, um, Bonaparte. Um, what's her first name? Ah, I can't, I just drew a total blank. Josephine, thank you. <laughs> Empress Josephine Bonaparte, Napoleon's first wife. He divorced her because she didn't give him an heir, um, but I believe he was still madly in love with her. So she's being portrayed by uh, Alana Lucas. Then we have Queen Victoria, who will be portrayed by Jessica Clements. And if we have time, I'm going to portray Alexandra, Alexandra Romanoff. Uh, who was the last uh, empress of Imperial Russia. That's if I have time to make the outfit, which I hope I do. I think I will, because um, I, I really want to wear something fabulous too. So uh, that is the whole lineup for the fashion show, and every queen has a story. So you're not just going to learn about the fashion, you're also going to learn a very significant piece of history, because we are going to talk about uh, the accomplishments of these individual queens. So uh, working on that as well. Working on the dress first, then we'll work on the little biography part. But uh, I'm really, really excited about this. I've been working my little heart out, working really, really hard on the details, um, trying to do this as best as my resources and talents can, can do. Um, what I did, and I've talked about this, I talked about this in the last couple weeks, is I've, I've studied um, historical portraiture of these various people and their contemporaries to try to pull together in my mind um, an outfit that I could make that would uh, be representative of them. I, I use their own portraits as inspiration since, number one, the same materials are not available today, and even if they were, I could never afford them. So I tried to get as close as I possibly could, and I'm very proud of my efforts so far because I really do think that these ladies could actually have worn such a dress. So I tried to be as historically accurate as I could with construction. I have to cheat a little bit because I'm going by measurements. I don't have everybody only a few people are able to come to me for an actual fitting. So given that, I, I have to fudge a little bit to know that these things are going to fit. Um, so, you know, if, if everybody was able to come to me personally for a fitting, I could get even closer on historical accuracy. But I tried to be very accurate. Absolutely no zippers or, or um, modern closures. Um, I don't hand sew everything, but I do hand sew a lot of the finishing work. So um, I use I do use a machine because otherwise it would take me it would take me weeks or months to get some of this stuff done. Uh, this one has taken the longest. Well, this the Marie Antoinette gown took a long time too. I really struggled with that one and the Catherine the Great. So these three were very involved. This has the most pieces. So I wanted to show you tonight um, everything that has gone into this so far. It's not quite finished, very close. Heather's coming this weekend, supposed to be coming, weather permitting. 
Uh, she lives five hours away, so she and her mom were going to drive. They, they drove here um, once before when I made another dress for her, but they're going to drive and spend the night and then, you know, go back the next day. So um, she is coming for a fitting because uh, it's, this is just too important not to get it exactly right. So um, let me see if there's any comments or questions before I go into the nitty gritty of how this dress is being made. So uh, I'm just scanning through. Hey, John Paul, it's great to see you. It's been a long time. Um, thank you, Lori. That, thank you uh, for your compliments about last year. Um, Becky said she's looking forward to this year as well. Uh, let me see, and Tina, Katerina. Hey, Tina. Um, oh, okay, <laughs> she said I got her, um, I got her, uh, her dress the fit right which which was really good well I've had really really good luck but it's not a hundred percent you know I do the best I can but sometimes sometimes it's the fault of the pattern sometimes it's the fault of the measurement sometimes it's the fault of me if something doesn't fit right but I, I try really hard so I'm really excited to talk about this dress it's unique in many ways uh, this uh, this particular dress is representative of the late Elizabethan era, era, which would be, let's see, the 15, later 1580s is when this big cartwheel is called a French farthingale. The big round drum shape came into fashion. Um, again, the fashion was set by the Queen Elizabeth. I'm not sure why she went this route, but um, this big old drum is called a French farthingale, or um, I've seen it, I think they call it a wheel a wheel farthingale or a drum farthingale, but the the um, a proper name is the French farthingale. So it's just a big wheel. Now those in themselves, I knew I had I couldn't do the dress without this. This was crucial. This is the only fashion that uses this shape, to my knowledge. I've never seen this shape of dress in any other era, um, and it was crucial um, to get the shape right. And you have to start with the underpinnings. No dress. No historical dress is ever going to look right without the proper underpinnings, which is either, it can be um, both, either or, <laughs> um, a corset and some kind of um, skirt support, which could be a hoop skirt, crinoline, um, bustle. I mean, there are various things for various periods. For this particular period, the skirt is supported by this big wheel, French farthingale, and a big heavily um, stuffed bum pad which actually holds that holds the wheel up I'm not gonna undress the mannequin because it would be really hard to do um, but I will show you so I was able to locate on eBay couldn't find it on Etsy well yeah there was one on Etsy for like six hundred dollars a wheel farthingale that's crazy um, I was able to find one on eBay made in China you know you can get really really cheap 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 as in inexpensive and cheap as in poor quality um, hoop skirts um, from China. Now, if you're only gonna wear them a couple of times, it's perfectly fine as long as you get the right size and the right shape uh, for, for, your, um, for your dress. Um, I have a bunch of cheap ones from China and when they fall apart, I pull out the hoop wire and I use that wire for my own projects. So that's kind of what I did here. So I'm going to show you, um, I was able to locate, uh, first I looked on Etsy, because I don't have time to make all the underpinnings and it's not fun and it's expensive. Um, hoop wire, this, this hoop steel is very expensive. So it sometimes would cost me more for the materials than to just buy one that's ready made, unless it's something that's crazy expensive. Plus this isn't fun and I don't like to take the time to do underpinnings. I've done it a few times. I made this crazy big elliptical crinoline cage two years ago for Colette Cameron because you cannot buy those. Um, it's a very unique shape worn in the, in the late 1860s. So I did make one. I have a pattern for it. I could make another. I have never made another one. I've made one. <laughs> I don't want to make another one, but if I have to, I will. Um, so I was real excited to find, ta-da, this is really, it's just a big pancake. It's like a pancake tutu or a platter tutu in ballet. But this came from China. I ordered it in hope, hoping that it would work for this dress. 
but there were a couple of issues. First of all, the size. The waist is very, very tiny. It's got an elastic. It barely fits me. I have a 28 inch waist and it was very tight on me. I can wear it, but anybody who's got, you know, a larger waist, it, it, if it even fits, it would be very uncomfortable because I found it not very comfortable. The other thing is it's really flimsy. The fabric is really cheap nylon. It would tear easily and it just isn't strong enough to support. I, I, could, I could use this with silk. Um, I, I'm keeping it because I'll use it for me and I can use it for a gown made of really lightweight material like silk. Um, but velvet, forget it. There's no way this would uh, work. So what I did do is once, once I looked at it, I have to see things. Uh, I don't do well with written instructions so much, but I can see things and figure out how to make them a lot of the time, not all the time. But this is fairly straightforward, fairly simple. So I decided, all right, so I'll use this as a pattern. So I traced it and I used this as a pattern. I made it bigger. I made the width of it a little bigger. I made obviously the waist of it bigger and I used a much heavier fabric. I used two layers of um, a canvas weight material. I used hoop steel and I even put a couple pieces of boning this way because this doesn't have any boning. Uh, it's only got the hoop steel. So I did put some boning this way to help support it further yet. So I did make my own um, French farthingale, which I'll pull up the skirt on the dress and show it to you as much as I can show it to you. So you can see. So I was really happy. That was the first thing I knew I would get nowhere. I couldn't even start this dress until I had that item because everything depended on the shape. Without the proper shape, how do I know how to cut the skirt? How do I know the length of the skirt? You know, because this makes the skirt stick out. It changes the length. Um, just, I really had to have it. So I made my own using that one as a pattern. And I'll just lift the skirt. I don't know how much detail you can see. But you, um, I'll bring the phone up. So you can see I used a much heavier uh, fabric. I used two layers here. Uh, here's, uh, if you can see, this is uh, part of the boning. I put four pieces of, of heavy plastic boning running this way to reinforce the weight. Um, I do have a bum pad with this. Let me see if I can show that to you also. But I'm making a bigger one. Whoops, the, the mannequin is on the skirt. Okay, here we go. Hopefully I got it. Okay, I don't know if I can... In the strong. Okay, so there's a bum pad under here as well, and you see that's helping to, to, to hold this up. I need, it's not stuffed enough. I need to make another one. This particular one's really hot to wear. I noticed when I, the material, it holds heat, and I've, when I've worn it before with my Georgian stuff, I've noticed my bum gets really hot. I get really, really hot in my bum. So I'm going to make another one out of just a cotton. This is like some kind of a quilted fabric, which I thought would be good for the stuffing, but the quilting makes it hot on your bum. So this um, helps to hold up the French farthingale. So the first element of this dress um, was to make the skirt. Um, the fabric, I actually ordered this fabric. This was um, custom made for me. Uh, I had seen just online, I had seen a sample, a picture of uh, embroidered velvet online and I just, immediately pictured an Elizabethan gown, a really rich, regal looking Elizabethan gown. And so I have a connection in India who I buy um, all of my silk fabric from. And um, I asked them if they had any velvet and if they could embroider velvet, because I get, that's where I get all my embroidered silks. And um, the, because I'm a good customer, <laughs> I buy a lot of fabric from them. I'm a good customer. They agreed to, um, to make this for me. I sent them a photograph of the, um, this floral pattern that I liked, and, uh, but I was obligated to buy a minimum of 20 yards, so it was expensive. So usually my dresses are one of a kind, and I tell you that, but I had to buy 20 yards of this, so I will be using this fabric for another dress. It was very expensive, and I'm not gonna waste any of it. Um, I probably won't 
if I can find something besides an Elizabethan dress that I that it's really suitable for, I will. I love it for this, but you know, I want Heather to feel really special about her dress. Um, if I do another Elizabethan, I would probably do it for myself. I love this. I love this. But um, I'm, my, in my mind, I'm still thinking of other eras that this might work for. And I actually think it could work for a 19th century ball gown. Um, I, I think I could see this, um, you know, Gone with the Wind era, the beautiful flowers on the, you know, the big, the big hoop skirt, the puff sleeves, maybe, maybe. Uh, and that would give it a totally different look. So that's a possibility. Um, and, and the big hoop skirt would really showcase this gorgeous embroidery. So I might do that with it, but like I said, I do have quite a bit, uh, 20 yards was enough to make at least two dresses, uh, possibly three, depending on the style of the dress, if something's slim cut. So, um, that was the first thing. Um, the, the fabric, uh, I started on the skirt first, and the only thing that's not accurate about the skirt at this point and if I can do it I will but again Heather has to try this on first in the in the um, in all the portraiture and all the um, pictures that I've seen of Elizabethan gowns with this type of a gown there is actually a ruffle and it is made with this it's not a separate some some people who do costumes they do a separate like an overskirt that ends here and that's not correct it's actually the skirt itself, whoops, my sleeve just fell off, those are just pinned. The skirt itself um, is um, gathered up under the wheel and it's made into a, like a ruffle or a flounce right on the edge like that. And I don't know if it would work. Um, I don't know. What I read is that they pinned it. So every time the lady would wear this dress, her maid would sit here and pin and pin and pin. It must have taken hundreds of pins to pin this flounce. So uh, I could possibly try to hand stitch it. I don't know if those stitches would hold. I wish I could stitch it to the farthingale, but that's not practical because then they, the two pieces would be attached. So I don't know yet how I'm going to do it or if I'm going to do it. If I cheat on this, I might leave out that flounce because really only um, true uh, fashion historians would, e would even know, would even notice. So um, one of my sleeves fell off, so I'll pick that up. The next thing I'm going to talk about are the sleeves. Um, this, this dress has two sets of sleeves. Um, the, there's a long, and the, again, these aren't stitched yet. They're made, but they aren't stitched to the bodice yet. I just have a safety pin in these. These are called hanging sleeves. These are attached to the bodice of the gown. So let me see. My arm, wait, which way is my arm going in? My arm's on the, oh, it goes on this side. Oh, okay, here we go. So we've got our, no, that's not right. I can, I can never remember how this goes on. Okay, no, yeah, that's the armpit, yes. So the hanging sleeve. And then the other sleeve goes on the inside of it. And these sleeves are tied on. So these are not attached at all to the bodice. The other sleeve is sewn on. And again, I haven't figured out. I had it pinned correctly, but I got confused about how I had it on there. Um, so the second set of sleeves, these are under sleeves. These are only tied. They're tied with ribbons um, to the bodice. So these can be changed out. So there are two parts of this gown. The stomacher and the sleeves could be changed. So you could have a, a different look to your gown if you had a second set of sleeves and a second stomacher. So these are stuffed with netting to make them really poofy. And I had sewn the pearls and the trim on, and I just wasn't happy with them. I, I wanted a, a fabric, that, the Elizabethans were not matchy-matchy at all. You'll find a lot in the Tudors, you, you'll find a lot of pattern mixing. They, uh, they didn't even always stick to the same color scheme. So I went out looking for some fabric that would evoke that non-matchiness. It, it, it would give, it would be the same colors, but I wanted a different texture, a little different color, a little different pattern. And I really liked 
I'll give you a close up. This it's a kind of a polka dot, but it's also a geometric design and it has a little bit of texture. So I really liked this. But um, when I finished the sleeves, I wasn't happy, so I decided to add these false puffs. This is not a slash sleeve, um, but I simulated the slash sleeve, which you see a lot in um, the Renaissance era, or if you're British, the Renaissance. <laughs> so um, I did a false puff, which I think came out really well. So I'm really happy with those. So I just, I have to just finish, I have to put some binding on here and put the ribbons on here so they can be tied on. So right now they're just pinned with a little pin. So um, so we have the sleeves, the two sets of sleeves. Okay, I did the dress a little, uh, here's the stomacher, I'm gonna take the stomacher off. So this, this is a front closing dress. So I made it so that you could close it completely and we're gonna put the stomacher on top, I think. But we'll see, when she comes, I might cut it and sew the stomacher in. I'm not sure how I'm gonna do this yet. But here is the bodice. Again, it's not finished. This is not finished on the bottom. But I put the laces in so that she'd be able to try it on and we'd know if it fit or not. And then we'll figure out how we're gonna attach the stomacher, or if we're gonna sew it or just use hooks and eyes. Personally, I think I would like to leave it so it just laces up and we maybe just attach the stomacher. But, um, but we'll see how it goes. I might attach one side and put hooks on the other. I'm not sure because it would be nice if she'd be able to change it out later if she wanted to. Uh, it could be done. Okay, so uh, let's see, we talked about, oh, the bodice she has to try on. It's mostly done, but I can't do anything more till she puts it on. And then we'll figure out how we're attaching the stomacher. The, the part that I did today, the part, haha, is the partlet. Um, this is just, is, is basically a dicky, a Elizabethan style dicky, and it's very pretty. Um, I made this with a faux silk, and instead of having ties, a tie closure, I closed it with this pretty Elizabethan style brooch. I'm gonna give you a close up view of the partlet and brooch. So um, this is another piece of the dress that I finished today. And I really like this bright white and gold. I think it really sets off that black velvet. Um, and then the other elements that I'm still working on um, are the, uh, the ruff, which you saw already. I, I showed you guys the ruff in, in photographs. Um, I'll show you the ruff again. Uh, where did I leave it? Is it here? Oh, I've got to get it from the other room. Be right back. So, so I was I was talking about the rough um, last week. Uh, this little puppy took me about twelve hours to make. It's um, almost completely hand sewn. It's, um, I think it looks really pretty, but um, we wanted to use it as a standing ruff. The ruffs that you see standing out, n not wrapped around the, the neck, but standing out, they are the same kind of ruff. They're just worn differently. So this actually is supposed to be able to be worn two ways. So this is the first way that you're used to seeing in uh, Elizabethan uh, portraits. And it looks really beautiful. It's not a flattering look. It looks like, you know, you have a head on a platter. But um, you should be able to take the same ruff and you just turn it around and you pin it into the neckline of the dress and then it acts as a standing collar. But my problem with this is I haven't been able to get it to look right as a standing collar. I'm gonna pin it now so I can pick up the other pieces. So one of the problems I thought, well, I read that this needs a support and obviously it does because it's not a really stiff fabric. I did stiffen it, but you see in the back, it's, it's, it's drooping in the back and it's wanting to collapse. I don't want it to collapse. So. I read that with the standing collars, they had a device to support it, a su supportas, 
S-U-P-P-O-R-T-A-S-S-E. I assume it's Supportas. I don't know how to pronounce it, if I'm saying it wrong or not. But um, I made one of those. So this goes around the head, and it's supposed to hold the collar up. So I thought, great, I was really proud. I was able to figure out this This was made just like a hat, really. I used buckram and wire, and, you know, it took a little engineering. Um, got it made, but it doesn't work with this ruff. I, I can't get it to work right. So when I put this on, it, I think the ruff is too big for it. I think that's my problem. Because I can put this on, and it looks pretty by itself. It's, it's really pretty. So we can do this, and maybe it's just not big enough, but um, you see how much smaller that is than my actual ruff? I think this would work for a small ruff, but then why would a small ruff need a support? I don't know. I used a, a um, historically accurate Elizabethan pattern. At least it's supposed to be historically accurate. Um, it wasn't a commercial pattern. It's somebody who specializes in Elizabethan um, and peri period clothing. Um, let me see. I have a smaller ruff. This is the first ruff I made. This was my trial run. I even tried it with the smaller ruff. And I think it works for the smaller ruff. Yeah. See, I think that would work. That works, don't y'all think? So, I'm wondering what I should do. Um, this particular ruff, I, I, it's... I don't like it with this outfit. Um, I might save it for something Regency. It's made out of just like a cotton eyelet. But I think that's the size that this needs. I think this is just too big for it. But I love it and it's so beautiful. Um, the only other thing I could do, I don't know if Teresa, Teresa, are you out there tonight? Teresa, I need your advice. Um, so maybe I'll have to um, PM Teresa and see what she thinks. The other thing is, I can take these both away. The other thing I thought of is making this ruff even bigger. I thought either I have to make it bigger or smaller and do away with the ruff support, make it bigger. And I've seen them that have ribbons that tie behind the back. And you see when I pull on these ribbons, how it makes the back stand up. See, if I do that. It's, the back of it still might collapse the very back, but I don't know. But it doesn't go all the way down to the neckline. I've got about a three inch gap on both sides. So I think that looks funny. I think the only way that this would work would be if I made the ruff that much bigger on each side so that this, I'll pull it down on one side. I think it needs to go all the way down to the neckline so it kind of circles the head like a halo. So in that case, I think I need to add that much more to this ruff, which means taking it apart and putting a bigger band in it and adding to it. I do have some material left. I mean, I already have 12 hours in this thing. If I'm gonna do that, it's probably gonna take me at least five or six hours, maybe more to do that. Um, or I make it smaller. Now, I don't want to take it apart because um, if I can't make it small, I'd have to make a smaller one is what I would have to do. I would just have to cut more fabric and maybe make it the size of the other one. Um, and then, then it would work with that, um, with that bolster, with that support us. So what do you guys think? I mean, I love the great big ruff. The other thing is there is this other contraption. It's this big wire framed um, in some of the portraits. It's, sometimes it's heart shaped, but it comes way out like this. That might be too ambitious for me to do one of those because um, I don't think you'd wear a great big ruff with one of those, but the smaller ruff with the great big frame support. I, I uh, It's the big collar that stands up in the back. And to do one of those, I just, I don't know, that might be too much, um, too much time and aggravation, and and I still need a, a rough that will work. So, um, 
I don't know what else to talk about, but that's where I'm at. So I think the only thing I have to figure out is the rough right now. Everything else I think is pretty much figured out. The only thing left on the dress is jewels, pearls, long draped pearls. Elizabeth loved her pearls. And Heather has some really, really long strands of big pearls that she's gonna bring with her. I think they're going to be perfect. And for you guys who haven't seen, I think most of you have seen, on my mannequin that's standing behind me is the wig. So we do have, and I did make this. I bought a really cheap synthetic wig, a curly red wig, and I styled it. Elizabeth is in an Elizabethan hairdo. So here is the hair, and I hand sewed all of those pearls. They're not glued, they're sewn into her hair. So I used my book, and I think I did a really good job, especially for a very, very first effort. I'm proud of that, that hair. I think I did a good job with it. I'm very proud of it. I think it looks um, quite true to the period. Um, and not too messy. It, it's fairly neat. Um, hopefully it doesn't fall apart with handling because because I've noticed, you know, when I'm styling wig, I mean, they're just pinned and you've got to be so careful when you're handling them. So they can only, only be worn a couple times before they have to be completely restyled again. So hopefully this will, um, will last us through the fashion show. I'm definitely going to put it on her when she comes for the fitting. Um, provided, you know, we're in good shape, I'm hoping to be able to get her completely in costume and makeup and hair and everything and take some pictures here at home. So that is where I am at. I'm really excited about all of these dresses, really excited about this fashion show. And I hope if any of you guys have been on the fence about going to Williamsburg, I hope you will join me because it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I'm not going to be I'm going to be there. I'm going to be involved in some other activities, but not super, super involved because this is so much of my time and energy just making this happen that I've kind of stepped back from everything else. But I am going to be um, host, hosting um, the tavern dinners. So in the evening, if you want to go out to dine in a colonial tavern, I'll be taking a group on Thursday and on Friday night out to a authentic colonial tavern. I went last year to two of them. There are several good ones. There are three really good ones. They're very expensive, but the food is really, really good. And it's an experience. It really is. It's very entertaining. Um, in Williamsburg, they don't live on our timetable at all. If you go out to dinner, it's two to three hours for dinner. And, but it's really amazing. It's wonderful. And, and that's not two to three hours because you get terrible service. It's just they do so much more. Um, so last year the food was really, really good. And the service was, was, it was just great because they tell stories and um, sometimes they have musicians and you really feel like you're living in the 18th century and, and dining at a public house in the 18th century. They really try to set that mood and everybody kind of stays in character. So it's it's not like dinner theater. Um, you're, it, it's, it's, it's just how they serve. It's just how they are. Uh, so it feels really good and really fun and authentic. So I guess that's all I have to say to share tonight. I'm working really hard. I still have several to do and time is running short. I have four weeks and I have some other commissions I need to work in as well. So um, I'm really, really busy and I'm fighting a cold. I keep, uh, I've got the scratchy throat and the stuffy nose and I've been taking echinacea like crazy. So I'm, I'm still fending it off, but I feel like I'm on the verge. I haven't gone to the gym because I figured that would push me over the edge into full-blown sickness. So I feel like I'm just on the verge of catching it. I've been warding it off for three days now. So hopefully it goes away. So, um, I guess I am going to call it a night. I hope you guys enjoyed this. And as always, um, please share my videos and share my dresses. I appreciate it a lot. 90% of my business is word of mouth. So I, I do appreciate it when you share my stuff with your friends. So I will say good night now. See you next week.
Bye.